Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Have you ever watched any of those videos in which Irish people try weird food from around the world? I did recently, and something stuck out to me. Many of the people on that show aren't really used to Mexican food. I mean, they know what it is, they've had Mexican food, but it's still just a little exotic. Sort of how, for some Americans, a good Indian curry might be a little bit exciting. But on the other hand, going out for tamales isn't exactly exotic to most of us. Delicious, yeah, but not exotic. On the inverse, for people in the British Isles, grabbing a curry is an absolutely everyday affair. I suppose it's all about empire. You know, the British occupied Ireland and India, so Ireland has curry. A large part of the U.S. was once the region of New Spain called Mexico, so we have tamales. And in researching today's show, I noticed something else, specifically about names. Due almost entirely to Spanish imperialism, I have an easier time with Filipino names than I do with some of the names on that YouTube channel. I don't speak a word of Filipino or a word of Gaelic, but while I can't pronounce half of those Irish names, I'm relatively comfortable with a number of Filipino names. The official language of the Philippines, Filipino, is distinct from most of its neighboring languages thanks to Spanish influence. They write in Latin script as opposed to their ancient script thanks to Spanish influence. Many indigenous names of peoples and places have been lost thanks to Spanish influence. Today we're looking at the dawn of that influence through the lens of Ferdinand Magellan. This is episode 121, The Winds of Fate. Magellan's departure from Guam was a chaotic affair. In their raid to reclaim their stolen property from the Camoro, they killed a number of men. Antonio Pigafetta, the chronicler of the voyage of Magellan, writes, quote, We saw some of the women who cried out and tore their hair. I believe it was for the love of those we had killed. End quote. Over 100 Comoro proas chased after the departing ships, and they sped by at amazing speeds. They moved in and around the hulls of Ferdinand Magellan's vessels and threw rocks at the crew, and they hit a number of the crewmen, and they moved too fast for Magellan to get any shots off at them. Eventually, though, Magellan was too far out to sea, and the Comoro proas turned back. Magellan plunged back into the unknown reaches of the ocean. A few days later, Lookout spotted several islands in quick succession and stopped at the smallest island in view. Considering their experience with the Comoro, Magellan wanted an uninhabited island. The men were weak with hunger and scurvy. Magellan sent the strongest among them ashore to gather what food they could. Lawrence Burgreen writes in Over the Edge of the World, quote, It was the fifth Sunday in Lent, with Easter fast approaching. Appropriately, Lent is dedicated to Lazarus, risen from the dead, and like him, the surviving crew members had overcome their illness to regain their strength and persevere. End quote. Magellan actually named these islands after Lazarus, but that name didn't stick. And Magellan didn't stick around either. They made for another island that had a much more suitable anchorage where they could make landfall and finally, blessedly, rest. They erected tents on shore and collected fruit and slept for days. Now Magellan didn't really know where he was. He suspected he might be in the Spice Islands. He wasn't, but he wasn't far off. After about a week, though, they were approached by a small fleet of proas. Now these proa were clearly of a different design than those from Guam, but Magellan was wary. He armed the men and they drew up battle lines. A group of local men made landfall and kept their distance. But Magellan... Well, first of all, Magellan had a companion with him, known to history as Enrique of Malacca. Enrique had been Magellan's slave since his first voyage to the East Indies under the Portuguese India Armada. Magellan purchased Enrique after he aided in the conquest of Malacca. Enrique spoke Malaysian, but he also spoke the languages of the Spice Islands, 
The new arrivals spoke a number of different tongues as well, but regardless of what languages they all tried, they didn't find any common language between them. Magellan's hopes were dashed. They weren't in the Spice Islands after all. Still, though, everyone was friendly enough. These men turned out to be fishermen who brought their catch ashore, and along with a few jugs of coconut wine, they held a little cookout. The following day, Magellan... Well, he took these new arrivals out to his ship and decided to be a bit daring. Last time he tried something like this, the locals stole everything that they could lay their hands on, the Camoro people. But these fishermen were less impetuous. Magellan showed them his bags of nutmeg and pepper and mace. The visitors grew excited and took Magellan on deck, and they pointed to the south. And we know today, of course, that that's right toward the Spice Islands. A few days later, the fishermen left, and Magellan prepared to set sail. But the question remained, where was he going to go? Magellan was still unsure where he was, but he was starting to suspect Now, no Europeans had ever been to these islands before, but they were a known factor. They had heard of them from Chinese and Arabian traders. And right now might be the best place to talk about a little bit of geography. If you sail west from Guam, you'll find the Philippines. That's where Magellan was at this point. South of the Philippines, you'll find Malacu, or we might know them as the Moluccas or the Spice Islands. That's where Magellan was aiming. These two groups of islands, the Moluccas and the Philippines, as well as the Marianas Islands, comprise what the conquistadors considered the Philippines, what we would call the Spanish East Indies. However, today, the Moluccas are part of Indonesia. The Indonesian islands that will eventually become key to our story include Borneo to the west of the Moluccas, Java to the southwest, and Sumatra further west than Borneo. Now, those are eventually going to be under Portuguese control. To the northwest, we see mainland Southeast Asia. Myanmar, Malaysia, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. They would have called it Siam back then, but that's a whole other bag of colonialist cats that we don't need to talk about. Nor do we need to talk about what's in the southeast. We'll get to that later. Many of the crew expected Magellan to sail south for the Spice Islands, but instead... Magellan set a westward route, after the way that the fishermen had gone. After two days of sailing, they saw an island that appeared to be glowing. They were campfires. Magellan, though, chose to stay at sea. He didn't know who that fire actually belonged to. Come morning, a canoe rode out to meet Magellan. They hailed him. And to the surprise of everyone on board, Enrique of Malacca responded. He could talk to these sailors, which suggests that Enrique had been here before, or at least somewhere nearby. And that means that Enrique of Malacca was probably the first human being ever to circumnavigate the earth. But about two hours later, after the men in the canoe rowed back to shore, two larger ships set sail out to meet Magellan. On the larger of these two sat an imperious-looking man under a canopy of large leaves. Now this imperious-looking man brought gifts to Magellan, gifts which Magellan wisely and politely declined. He turned out to be a Hindu leader named Raja Kolambu. Kolambu was under the authority of the Maharaja back in India. At This time in our story, there were four major powers in this region, in what we would call the Philippines. China had substantial trade interests in the region, in the Philippines and the Spice Islands. Their primary trading partners were the Hindu Rajanates, including this of Raja Kolambu. Now, sometimes the Rajanates were allies, and sometimes they were rivals, But at this point in the story, they were close allies against the newest players in the region, the Arabian Islamic Sultanates. And then there were the Datu. They were the traditional, indigenous leaders of the Philippines. Now all of these powers, the Sultanates, the Rajanates, the Chinese, and the Datu, were all in this dance of warfare and diplomacy and economic superiority. 
They'd been at it for centuries now, and whoever sat on top at any given time controlled the spice trade. And then there were the Portuguese. Now, the Portuguese weren't in the Philippines yet, but they were busy circling the spice islands like hungry sharks. The primary Portuguese colony in the Southeast Asian region was Malacca. That's in modern-day Malaysia. Ferdinand Magellan and Francisco Sorau were involved in that conquest. That's when Ferdinand Magellan bought Enrique. The Portuguese also had outposts in Java, Borneo, Siam, and even in China. They'd been busy. But then Magellan arrived in the Philippines at the head of a Spanish fleet, heralding the Spanish arrival. According to Antonio Pigafetta, and really most of this is according to Pigafetta, Magellan and Raja Colombo met on Good Friday 1521. I'm going to play it safe here and decline to say where it is they met. The location is disputed, and it's a point of pride for many Filipino people. The most likely possibility is a small island that was used as a trading post between the Rajanates and the Chinese. On Good Friday, they held a great feast under Raja Colombo. The Raja, Antonio Pigafetta, Magellan, and Enrique all shared a ceremonial cup of wine, which bound them together as friends. The following day, Holy Saturday, or Hallelujah Saturday, according to the Portuguese, Magellan and Raja Colombo held a different kind of ceremony. They rolled up their right sleeves, cut a slash into their forearm, and held those cuts together. They blended their heart's blood, binding them as brothers. And then the next day, on Easter, 1521, the voyage's resident priest held the first mass ever in the Philippines. In that ceremony, Raja Colombo was baptized. The symbolism here is impossible to ignore. This was the Spanish Empire reborn after the Reconquista, Or maybe it's the rebirth of the Filipino people in the light of Christ. There are a ton of potential interpretations, and usually that would make me suspicious of the date, but they appear to be accurate. And there is something more here. Easter is a celebration of literal rebirth, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But in the time before Christ, people still celebrated rebirth at almost the exact same time right around the spring equinox. That was a celebration of the rebirth of the sun, a celebration of spring and the rebirth of life to the world. It was a fertility festival, and similar festivals are still held around the world. The deities worshipped in these fertility festivals were almost always feminine and almost always voluptuous. There's a reason that people hunt chocolate eggs brought by a bunny at Easter. Neither eggs nor bunnies have anything to do with the rebirth of Jesus Christ, but both are ancient symbols of sex and fertility. And, you know, chocolate's pretty sexy as well. Of old, those voluptuous feminine deities were worshipped on the equinox with uninhibited sex. I bring this all up because of the tenor of the feast held on Easter Sunday, 1521, in the Philippines. Magellan placed a moratorium on sex with any non-Christians by anyone in his voyage. Pigafetta tells us that the men complied with that order, but it became a strained thing. I mean, the men were chomping at the bit here. They hadn't seen women for months, and now all of these lovely islander women were... Well, they were clearly interested in the newcomers. So Magellan spoke to the Raja Kalambu, who agreed that all of the women would convert to Catholicism along with him. The celebrations that ensued were distinctly pagan. Magellan, though, didn't take part in any of that. Instead, Raja Kalambu confessed his troubles to Magellan, troubles that included two other political groups in the region. The first of these was the Raja Humaban, who was the real Hindu power in the Philippines. He was the Raja and Datu of the island of Cebu. The Rajanate of Cebu was old. It dated back to the 13th century, so almost 200 years. 
They were powerful as well and favored in the eyes of the Maharaja. Now, technically, Raja Humaban and Raja Kolambu were equals, but practically speaking, Kolambu was a vassal of Raja Humaban, and the Datu of Cebu had given Kolambu a job, and that job involved the second faction that was giving Kolambu trouble, that was giving Magellan's new brother in blood and Christ trouble. The second faction were the Islamic Arabian powers in the Philippines. They held territory to the north, which was disrupting trade between the Rajanates and the Chinese. Magellan made a decision here, a decision that his crew didn't understand and didn't particularly care for. It's a decision that historians have debated for centuries now. After their Easter celebrations, the men all wanted to sail south to find the Spice Islands. You know, maybe they could establish diplomatic ties. Maybe they could build a factory and an embassy. What they would do without question was to fill their holds with spices. That was going to make them rich. That's why they were here. But instead of that practical decision, Ferdinand Magellan chose to honor his new brother and sail west for Cebu and the Raja Humabon. His plan appears to have been to introduce himself to Raja Humaban, to pay his respects, maybe gather some troops and supplies, and sail out to make war on the nearby Islamic power. His reasoning in doing so is most often given as religious zeal. He would be aiding what he saw as crypto-Christians. Remember, Hinduism wasn't really understood. He would be aiding them in a war against Islam. After all, this was a Spanish voyage, and that's basically their mission statement. There's a lot of merit to that analysis, and certainly some truth. But I do want to share Lawrence Bergreen's thoughts on the issue. He writes, quote, They were beginning to savor the available women, exotic food, and tantalizing hints of the Spice Islands. Yet a shadow hung over Magellan. Even if the rest of the expedition went flawlessly, there would be hell to pay when he returned to Spain for marooning Cartagena and the priest. He could never return home with honor, and so he pressed on, a fugitive from society and a captive to the winds of fate. End quote. The ramifications of that analysis are interesting. It makes me think that perhaps Magellan thought to set himself up as a ruler, victor over the Muslims who would be king and benevolently welcome the Portuguese to his domain once his cousin Francisco Sorau arrived. That's an interesting bit of alternative history. I mean, what if Magellan had succeeded? He might have been able to set the Philippines up to defend themselves against the incoming forces of Spain and Portugal. And perhaps Spain and Portugal would have been happy to have a regional ruler there who was friendly with them. Magellan, when he arrived on Cebu, was welcomed by Raja Humaban. He made his intentions clear. His plan was to oust the caliphs from the Philippines for good. That was music to Humaban's ears. Humaban agreed to be baptized and was christened Don Carlos, Captain General of Spain. This made him, as far as Spanish military rank was concerned, an equal to Ferdinand Magellan. Humaban was happy for the new allies, and... He gave Magellan all of the gifts that seemed to be traditional. After he was baptized, the women in his harem were baptized as well and made available to the men under Magellan's command. They were given food and feasts and celebrated throughout his domain. But the Rajah was skeptical. So Magellan prepared a grand display of European military prowess. He fired off his guns, he marched his men in parade, and they held an impromptu fencing competition. Humaban was duly impressed, but Magellan went ahead and did him one better. The people of the Philippines, of Cebu at least, had a much more decentralized form of government. They had their own regional chieftains, but very little centralized power. There was the Raja, but the regional chiefs didn't exactly respect that authority. It reminds me of England and the wake of the Norman Conquest. You have all of these regional warlords who were having trouble adjusting to the new feudal structure. Magellan encouraged some of those leaders to follow a more Spanish, feudal form of government. He converted them and convinced them to properly swear fealty to King Don Carlos. 
So why was Magellan doing all this? Well, he learned that Raja Humaban didn't have a son. His nephew was the heir presumptive, but that wasn't a certainty. Magellan consolidated Humaban's power through himself. That would put him in a perfect position to serve as a sort of viceroy, and then, once the Raja died, to take command as king of the Philippines. However, one of the regional leaders resisted Ferdinand Magellan. When King Don Carlos sent word that he required a tribute, this leader didn't send the food that was to aid Magellan in the upcoming war. His name was Chief Lapu-Lapu of Mactan Island. Lapu-Lapu had always been troublesome. The Mactan people were indigenous people who had always resisted the Rajanate's control. Their island was just off the coast of Cebu. Lapu-Lapu, the Raja explained, was always a thorn in his side. He was powerless to handle them. I mean, it's not like the people of Mactan Island were powerful or anything, but... Humaban's people were indigenous as well. They were related to the people of Mactan. They didn't want to fight them. It's embarrassing, really. But a man like Magellan, a man who so clearly had such power at his fingertips, and Humaban had heard the women in his harem discuss the strength of the Europeans, well, Lapu-Lapu and the people of Mactan would be nothing compared to that. Were Magellan to take care of that little thorn on Mactan Island... Humaban could devote his full resources to aiding Magellan in his quest. And with Lapu-Lapu gone, Mactan Island would be in need of a new ruler, wouldn't it? Magellan prepared his ships and his men and sailed for Mactan Island. On the night of 27th April, Magellan arrived. Pijafetta writes of that arrival, quote, at midnight, sixty of us set out armed with corselets and helmets, together with the Christian king, by which he means Humaban, the prince, by which he means Columbu, and some of the chief men. We reached Mactan three hours before dawn. The captain, Magellan, did not wish to fight, but sent a message to the natives to the effect that if they would obey the king of Spain, recognize the Christian king as their sovereign, and pay us our tribute, he would be their friend. If they wished otherwise, he goes on, they should wait to see how our lances wounded. They replied that if we had lances, they had lances of bamboo and stakes hardened with fire. They said that in order to induce us to go in search of them, for they had dug certain pit holes filled with spikes between the houses in order that we might fall into them. End quote. I said last time that we would be discussing the most famous of the three classic blunders. Most of you, I hope, understood that reference, but if you didn't, allow me to explain. When the dread pirate Roberts returned from the sea to claim the hand of his one true love, Buttercup, he found her engaged to the evil prince. Beyond that, he found her kidnapped. In his quest to find his one true love, he climbed the cliffs of despair. He fought a duel and defeated a giant, and then he matched wits with a cunning Sicilian. The Sicilian, believing the dread pirate Roberts defeated, told him, You've fallen prey to one of the three classic blunders. The most famous is never get involved in a land war in Asia. But we all understand that reference, right? It's never a good idea to explain a joke, so allow me to explain that joke. The U.S., for example, has gotten involved in four major land wars in Asia. The first was the American War in the Philippines, which did not go well for the United States. The second was the Pacific Theater of World War II, which was not going well for the Allied forces. The third was, of course, the Korean War, which did not go well for the United States. And the fourth was the War in Vietnam, which did not go well for the United States. Never get involved in a land war in Asia because, for example, they dug certain pit holes filled with spikes between the houses in order that we might fall into them. Their tactics didn't change because you don't need to fix that which is not broken. Of course, the second most famous of the three classic blunders is never to go against a Sicilian when death is on the line. Unfortunately, Magellan did not have a Sicilian. He had a Venetian, Antonio Pigafetta, but that's just not the same thing. And we really can't take everything that Pigafetta tells us at face value. 
For example, he tells us that Magellan armed and armored 49 men. That's true, but then there were the 400 or so converted locals that he also had on his side. Then Pijafeta tells us that Lapu-Lapu had more than 1,500 men on his side. That is almost certainly an exaggeration. But even still, Magellan was far outnumbered. But he had another, even bigger problem. There was a reef surrounding Mactan Island that would prevent his ships from getting in close to shore. Pijafeta describes it as more than two crossbow shots' lengths. That's out of range for the Harquebus that Magellan had on his ships. And remember, they didn't really have muskets. Reliable muskets were still decades off. They had a few harquebus that the men could carry, but mostly they had crossbows. So 49 men in breastplates and those Spanish conquistador helmets carrying spears and crossbows and the harquebus jumped into thigh-deep water to trudge over rocks and reef toward a shore that was occupied by three columns of warriors. Warriors that had sharpened bamboo spears who were expert fishermen with excellent aim. Naturally, the superior discipline and skill at arms of the Spanish and Portuguese soldiers led them to a swift and absolute victory. I'm just messing with you. You know, I was going to play the clip from The Princess Bride, but instead, I wanted to use this clip. The Mactan warriors rained spears down on the Spanish. There was a separate raid that did make it to shore that raided the Mactan village, but they were pretty swiftly defeated. But the main battle was here at the shoreline. The helmets and the breastplates of the Spanish did some good against the spears and arrows, but their legs were vulnerable. Plus, remember, they were wearing full boots, so it's not like they were moving very fast in the thigh-high water. Once the Mactan realized that the Spanish were slow and that their legs were vulnerable, once Magellan and his fifty or so men turned around and were retreating, the Mactan charged. They charged into the water without heavy boots or breastplates, and they wanted to engage the Spanish in hand-to-hand combat. Try to put yourself in that situation. Imagine that you're wearing heavy armor and leather boots that are filled with water. You're trying to wade through treacherous reef when spears come hurtling down at you. Maybe one of those spears is suddenly sticking through the throat of the guy standing next to you. He falls into the water. The water is filling with his blood. Your commander gives the order to retreat, but you can barely move. However you try, there's a dark-haired islander girl waiting for you. You're going to make it back to her, but then you feel a searing pain. You look down and there's a spear sticking through your leg. Then you hear a wild battle cry. You look behind you and you see 1,000 almost nude, crazy buff warriors rushing into the sea. To his credit here, Magellan rallied the men to defend the retreat. They fired a volley of small arms and crossbow bolts. And it worked. The Mactan fell back. But imagine trying to reload a musket a six-foot-long muzzle loader, and you're in thigh-deep water. Imagine trying to load a bolt into a crossbow. There's a decent chance that the crossbow is wet and useless, as wet and useless as your musket. And the Mactan realized it. They charged again. Magellan called for spears and swords and turned to face the incoming charge. According to legend, Lapu-Lapu himself led the Mactan charge. He's been lionized in Filipino myth for what followed. According to Pijafetta, quote, Recognizing the captain, so many turned upon Magellan that they knocked his helmet off his head twice. An Indian hurled a bamboo spear into the captain's face, but the latter immediately killed him with his lance, which he left in the Indian's body. Then, trying to lay hand on sword, he could draw it out but halfway, because he had been wounded in the arm with a bamboo spear. When the natives saw that, they all rushed themselves upon him. One of them wounded him on the left leg with a large cutlass. That caused the captain to fall face downward. They rushed upon him with iron and bamboo spears until they killed our mirror, our light, our comfort, and our true guide. When they wounded him, he turned back many times to see whether we were all in the boats. 
Thereupon, beholding him dead, we, wounded, retreated as best we could. End quote. All Magellan's plans died with him in the waters of Mactan Island. The Mactan chieftain, Lapu-Lapu, today is a hero of the Filipino people. A folk hero, a mythological hero almost. He's the first native Filipino to successfully resist European colonial aggression. In that respect, he's an Alfred the Great or George Washington to the people of the Philippines. Amazingly, maybe less than a dozen Spaniards were killed in the battle. Close to 150 of the converts died in that tertiary battle on land, and no reliable numbers exist for Mac-10 casualties, but it was low. There was a clause in Magellan's will that Enrique of Malacca be set free at the time of his death. However, after the death of Magellan, his brother-in-law and his cousin were voted the commanders of the fleet, and they decided they needed an interpreter. So they decided to ignore that clause that Enrique be set free. Now remember that the men had been preparing for a life here, perhaps on Mactan Island with women and wives. But more than anyone, the Malaysian interpreter Enrique had grown close to Raja Humaban. He was, after all, a neighbor of his. Together, those two organized a feast for the Portuguese leaders of the fleet, Magellan's brother-in-law and cousin Juan Sarau among them. All of the Portuguese officers were invited into the Raja's palace to enjoy his food and his women and his wine as a celebration of their brave showing in the battle. And they had that food, and they had that wine fed to them by beautiful women, and more wine, and more wine, until the time was deemed right, and the Rajah's agents locked the doors. Twenty-seven men were killed that night, and Enrique of Malacca was set free. At this point he disappears from our story, but presumably he returned home and lived a long and happy life. Juan Sarau, however, was left alive. He was the top-ranking officer, and he was brought to the docks where he begged the entirely Spanish crewmen to pay a ransom for his release. Sarau and the Raja and his agents waited, and they waited, and then they watched while the ships weighed anchor and sailed away. Pijafetta doesn't say what happened to Juan Sarau, but he was never heard from again. There was a bit of drama in the following weeks, but eventually the Spanish convict and one-time mutineer Juan Sebastian Elcano was voted in as commander of the voyage. Today, the voyage is properly called the Magellan-Elcano circumnavigation. Eventually, the fleet did reach the Spice Islands, and there they engaged in a touch of piracy. However, it's not the cool kind of piracy they weren't raiding ships to take their gold and nutmeg or anything like that. It was more of the our ships are leaking and we're out of food kind of piracy. But don't worry, we will get a solid dose of proper piracy next time. In the end, the voyage did make it back. However, only 18 men made it back to Seville. That's out of the total of 237 that set out from Spain more than two years prior. Really, the voyage wasn't much of a success, financially or imperially, but it did prove that the voyage could be made. Over the next couple of decades, Spain secured her control over the Americas. Francis Drake successfully made the circumnavigation using much better wind patterns, and eventually that trans-oceanic highway was used for Spain to establish their region of New Spain, officially called the Philippines. We're not really going to spend any time on that story. In case it hasn't become clear, I enjoy stories of explorers, but not particularly stories of conquistadors. Next time, we're going to be back with William Dampier and Charles Swan and the crew of the Signet. We're going to, finally, be looking at some good old-fashioned piracy as well. Piracy in a new world, at least a world new to our story, the world created by explorers like Ferdinand Magellan. And we're going to introduce a new kind of pirate, at least 
a new kind of thief and villain, the corporate kind. I've got to tell you all, I am very excited about the story on which we are about to embark. It's got everything that I love in a good pirate story. Exploration of the unknown world, intrigue and magic, sex, violence, and an overriding theme of the desire for and the search for freedom. And that story begins with the crew of the Signet. This is episode 122. Signet. I talk a big, egalitarian game about the common man, the regular crewmen, the everyday pirates who did the nitty-gritty work of piracy. It's not all about captains and admirals, right? But thus far it's been mostly about captains and admirals. It's partly a symptom of the sources. You know, Alexander Exquimelin wasn't detailing the life of the carpenter on board his ship, and in a lot of ways that's a shame for us. Basil Ringrose didn't do it either, really. But William Dampier, on the other hand, he takes the time. And I wonder why. Dampier was just a different kind of writer, and he was writing about something different. He was writing about his experiences on a certain voyage. Ringrose and Exquimelin were writing about their experiences from a larger vantage point. But even more than that, I think it was financial. By the time Dampier published A New Voyage Round the World, pirate stories were big business. Publishers were ravenous for new pirate tales. The Buccaneers of America was a sensation, published in more than a dozen different languages. It took the world by storm. The Adventures of Bartholomew Sharp was less successful, but a big hit in England. And remember, this was the late 1600s. Think about the options you had when you went to your local bookshop. Poetry and Shakespeare. Paradise Lost by Milton was a big hit. If you lived in Spain or had access to Spanish books, you could buy Don Quixote, which is great, and you had the Bible. And you know, that's all beautiful and important and even revolutionary literature, but... (sighs) And in England, you could buy the stories of King Arthur and his knights or Robin Hood and his merry men, and they were popular, but they were kind of old hat at that point, right? Pirate stories, on the other hand, were new and exciting, and they had what people really want in a good story, even if they don't want to admit it. Blood and booze and boobs. I mean, you couldn't just publish stories in which violent, drunken men murder Spaniards and seduce innocent women. That would be immoral. Instead, you published journalism about those violent, drunken men who murdered Spaniards and seduced innocent women. And they sold very, very well. Beyond the outrage and the pearl clutching, there was something about those stories that was titillating and exciting, a little bit dangerous. It reminds me in a lot of ways of James Bond. I mean, think about it. Here was an Englishman from a moderately well-off section of society that traveled to far distant parts of the globe where he engaged in violent murder, drinking a lot, and seducing innocent women. It's a way for people who are stuck in the humdrum of everyday life to read about something exciting that they might just be able to take part in if circumstances were slightly different. And then along comes William Dampier with a manuscript that promises to be the next bestseller full of blood and boobs and booze, everything that the people really wanted. And then you read it. There are pages and pages of... Wind patterns? Endless descriptions of the different kind of penguins and sea turtles he sees? I mean, that might be important, but it's not exactly going to fly off the shelves. And here's the thing. We actually have several different editions of Dampier's work. The first edition to which we have any access at all are his unpublished journals. And those are kind of boring. They're a bit technical and cumbersome, And the crew in that unpublished journal is somewhat understated. Sometimes they drink too much and fight too much and gamble too much, but for the most part, they're men who do their jobs. 
Then we see the first published edition of A New Voyage Round the World, and it's more fun. It's got all of the blood and booze and boobs that plants crave, and it's got characters. Not the relatively subdued characters from the unpublished journals. Now they're rowdy, drunk, lecherous, charming, violent pirates. In short, the characters become what Dampier's publishers were looking for, and it might be true to what they actually were, but not what Dampier was intending to write. And that's lucky for us, because we finally get a story with the real cast. Look at the story of Dracula. The character of Dracula is a character with which most people are familiar, as is, say, Captain Morgan. But the story of Dracula is much more rich due to the inclusion of the secondary characters. What is the story of Dracula without Jonathan Harker and Mina Murray and Abraham Van Helsing? Pirate stories are much the same way. They're a bit technical when you don't have a full, fleshed-out cast of characters. Over the following weeks, we'll be sticking pretty close to the crew of the Signet. We'll get to know many of the names of those on board pretty well. I'm not just going to dump all of those names here at the beginning, though. I do, however, want to introduce a few of these starring roles in the drama that's to unfold. First and foremost, there's the captain of the Signet, Charles Swan. We've talked about him before, but let's paint a picture of who he was, beyond the facts and figures. According to that first published account, Captain Swan is a jolly, boisterous, fat, ruddy-cheeked Englishman. I don't know why, but I picture him bald, with a bushy salt-and-pepper mustache, in a striped Victorian nightgown complete with a pointy cap and a candlestick, kind of like a fat Ebenezer Scrooge. He was a one-time privateer that served under Henry Morgan at Panama. He turned those profits into a successful career as a London merchant, and that former privateering experience is why he was chosen by a coalition of London investors to trade their goods on the Signet in the Americas. And remember, Signet wasn't his ship, he was merely hired to captain her. And then we have Dampier, and we've talked quite a bit about him already. He was a buccaneer, he was a naturalist, and he was a scientist who influenced Charles Darwin. His job on board the Signet, though, is a bit ambiguous. He would occasionally serve as a navigator and a cartographer, but it seems that he wasn't really part of the crew, that instead he was more of a gentleman passenger who paid his way through a bit of work. And we mustn't forget that I think, and I have argued, that Dampier may have been hired by shadowy agents in the court of King Charles II. You know, Lord Muckety Muck could have slipped Dampier a purse of gold at some point. Lord High Admiral So-and-So might have given Dampier a secret mission. This anonymous individual, if they did exist, and we'll call him hypothetically, I don't know, James, might have sent agents to Peru only a few years before the first Pacific adventure in a bid to explore the coast there, but he was turned around, which is why they had to hire a crew of pirates to do it without starting a war. You can hear me go way down that rabbit hole in a bunch of other episodes, though. Right now I want to talk about the crew of the Signet. There are a few other sailors that we need to keep our eyes on. There's Mr. Harthrop. And actually, Harthrop wasn't a sailor at all. He was a factor. Kind of a lawyer and accountant who was representing the investors back in London who paid for this whole voyage. His job was to protect their interests and their goods. Now, the position of factor on board a lot of private merchant voyages, such as this one, was often equal or even sometimes superior to the captain. The captain was still in charge of running the ship and such, but the factor would make the decisions about where they would call, how long they would stay, and what they carried on board. As you might imagine, this could lead to some tension and conflicts. You know, if a factor wanted to stick around a port until certain goods became available, or maybe until prices became more favorable, well, that was his prerogative. 
but that could take time. And if the time that they would spend in port clashed with the realities of wind and tides and supplies, well, a compromise would have to be reached. And often that compromise was less of a compromise and more a threat of imminent violence. As in, we're staying in Calcutta until the silk merchants arrive. (laughs) And then a dozen or so sailors with sharp knives show up to inform the factor that they do not intend to stay in Calcutta a day longer. The factor, on the other hand, might just spend the rest of his life there. It was a highly paid position, to be sure, but it wasn't without hazards. And believe me, you didn't want to be the one rich lawyer businessman on board when the crew mutinies and turns pirate. And then we need to mention the ship's pilot. He was a gruff, seasoned, experienced sailor named John Reed. Now, we don't know a lot about John Reed, historically speaking, but from the text we can gather quite a bit about his character. To me, the word that best describes him is competent, and not in the slightly snarky way that people these days say competent, just a really good sailor. He knew how to do just about everything on board a sailing vessel, and you might not want him cooking meals or tending wounds, but in a pinch, he could do either. Carpenter, gunner, boatswain, navigator, pilot, captain even... He could and had done it all. And what's more, John Reed was a sailor's sailor. He wasn't some fat London merchant. He wasn't a rich lawyer. And he wasn't a book-reading, ink-stained fop. He was a sailor, through and through. And there's one thing that I want you to keep in the back of your mind here. I'm not saying that it's the case, but this sailor was named John Reed. And what other pirate do we know of named Reed? We haven't met her on the show yet, but Mary Reed was born in 1685. Mary Reed's father was an English sailor who left England in 1684 on a merchant voyage. He never returned from that voyage, but rumor says that he turned pirate. Signet, carrying the pilot John Reed, left port right about 1684. Is there any real possibility that Mary Reed's father, the father of a woman who served under Charles Vane and was involved with Calico Jack and Anne Bonny, the father of one of the most notorious women in all of history, is there any real possibility that John Reed was her father? Could Mary Reed's father have been a privateer who served with men who sailed under Captain Morgan, Was he a buccaneer who sailed against Panama and Lima? Was he a member of the Brethren of the Coast who knew William Dampier and, well, spoilers for the story to come, but Thomas too and Adam Baldridge and Henry Avery? Is John Reed the connective tissue between titans and two eras of piracy? Probably not. I mean, the only reason I can even speculate about that is because we know so little about John Reed. But maybe... If you choose to use that as your headcanon, go right ahead. No one's going to stop you. Don't take it as established historical fact, but it makes the story a little more fun. And now there are a ton of other crew members that we're going to meet in the days to come, but there's one other that I want to mention right here at the outset. His name was Herman Coppinger, and he served on board Signet as the surgeon's mate. Now, of course, any ship worth its salt had a doctor for the crew, a surgeon, as it was called at the time. Some ships had a surgeon's mate, however. And a mate could be either a trained journeyman surgeon, or they could be an apprentice surgeon. Coppinger was the former. He was a journeyman who had his own medical kit and knew what he was about. The reason I bring him up... In fact, the reason I'm bringing all of these characters up, especially John Reed and Coppinger, is because their story is so central to what's to come, and I want us to remember them moving forward. The thing that makes Coppinger important was his relationship with William Dampier. They were both educated men who had contacts back in London, and Coppinger was apparently pretty interested in some of the scientific findings in Dampier's journals. 
And that might have been it. They might have just been friends. But they may also have been lovers, which is a big supposition on my part. At no point does Dampier say anything to suggest that. We honestly can't even conclusively argue that Dampier was attracted to anyone, including men or women. But there is some circumstantial evidence that feels, to me, pretty convincing here. Now, I'm not going to give that away, that's the story to come, but keep that in the back of your mind. Some of Dampier's decisions along the way are going to make a lot more sense if he and Coppinger were in a relationship. I'm going to point those out whenever we come to them, but we could begin that look at the beginning. I have concocted this large and intricate conspiracy theory, this Pepe Silva version of events that gives motivations for William Dampier to go on the first and second Pacific adventures, and I stand by most of it. But does any of it really explain Dampier's decision to abandon his friends and his comrades on board Bachelor's Delight? It, it could. There's no reason to think that England wasn't interested in the Spanish East Indies. I mean, we know they were, but we know they were because they already had a foothold in Asia. There's not really any reason for Dampier to cross the Pacific to get there. It simplifies the whole question if we just assume that William Dampier had a boyfriend on board the Signet. When you have to build this huge Pepe Silva version of events, really doesn't it just make more sense to assume that love was involved? And then take this little tidbit. You know, the crossing of the Pacific was hard on everybody, except for a select few. Captain Swan had a hidden stash of vitamin C-rich preserves, which he hoarded for himself, but doled out just a little bit to the two men most responsible for keeping the crew alive, the surgeon and the surgeon's mate. They were necessary to complete the crossing. And then Dampier writes in regard to the short rations that everyone was on, quote, I believe that this short allowance did me a great deal of good, though others were weakened by it. I found that my strength increased and my dropsy wore off. End quote. And he gives some possible reasons for this to be the case, but doesn't that seem just a little suspicious? And it could be that his social standing netted Dampier a portion of the captain's hidden stash but it certainly wouldn't have hurt to have a boyfriend who was the surgeon. So we have Captain Charles Swan, we have William Dampier, we have the pilot John Reed, and we have the surgeon's mate Herman Coppinger. Those are the most important characters for now. We'll get to the rest in due time. When we left off talking about the signet, the crew had just completed their Pacific crossing, they made landfall at the island of Guam, where they met the Comoro people. They traded with the Comoro people for food, and the Comoro were happy to help the Signet avoid the Spanish who had a fortified harbor there on Guam. But that wasn't going to last. Signet was a large, conspicuous ship. It stood out from the local proa, and it was going to be noticed partly because there were so few Comoro left on Guam. And they weren't all dead, you know, they weren't victims of genocide, as were so many Native Americans. There were still thousands of Comoro native to Guam alive. They were just, at this point, living elsewhere. See, they'd recently had a bit of a revolt. They'd burned Spanish farms and storehouses and even a barracks. Now, this wasn't nearly enough to chase the Spanish off of Guam, but it was enough to send a message. It also ensured that most of the perpetrators, which included the majority of the Comoro, had to flee to neighboring islands in the Marianas. And when Signet arrived, they made contact with the Comoro who were still on Guam. They traded for food, including that coconut, mango, and rice soup. Of course, Dampier described the local Comoros as, quote, strong, copper-colored, long-visaged, and stern of countenance, end quote. He goes on to hint at the welcome that the men experienced, 
But Dampier was never all that interested in describing the women of a place. You know, I think that he was more interested in the strong and stern type. But if we return to Magellan for a moment, Antonio P. Giaffetta was happy to do that. He wrote, quote, The women go naked except when they cover their nature with a thin bark. They are beautiful and delicate and have loose hair flowing, very black and long, down to the earth. End quote. Those women, or, you know, their descendants, were the same that fed the crew of Signet their fresh fruits and their coconut milk broth. They were the women that nursed the men back to health, and when the men were finally strong enough, they were the women who took them to bed. However, they did so with a purpose. The Comoro wanted help, and they thought that that might help them get it. See, the Comoro weren't happy about the Spanish occupation of their island, and while well, those that were left hadn't taken part in their little revolt, they were sympathetic. Once it finally became clear that the English were not Spanish, nor were they friends of Spain, the Comoro did everything in their power to bring them into the fold. They asked if the English would aid them. Captain Swan was careful not to make any sort of promises, but he made it clear that they would not fight alongside the Comoro. Shortly thereafter, the delicious coconut and rice soup dried up, the affections of the women grew cold, and somehow word got out of the English presence on Guam. The next time the Comoro came out to make contact, they brought a Spanish priest with them. Swan and Dampier greeted the priest on board Signet, warmly with all of the respect due a priest. They ate and they talked, and Captain Swan divulged his purpose at Guam. More than anything, he needed food. He had money to pay for it and wanted very much to peacefully trade to the benefit of everyone involved. But he also made it clear that they really needed the food and they would do whatever it took to get it. The major problem here was that Comoro revolt that had just happened. They burned a lot of the food and the farms, so stores were light at the moment. But the priest did agree to write a letter to the governor of Guam, and he also agreed to stay with the English as a hostage. Now this might seem a little bit rude, you know, the priest agrees to help you when you take him hostage, but it's the sort of service that many priests were more than happy to provide. And, in fact, you'll still see that in the modern world. Usually the priests were treated well, as this priest was, and this sacrifice had the potential to save lives. I'm always really impressed by this sort of thing. Take a look at Henry Morgan or Richard Sawkins or any of a number of other English pirates. They didn't have a great track record when it came to not torturing and horrifically murdering Spanish priests, and it's not out of the question to think that this priest here had personal knowledge of the piracies committed by these specific Englishmen. Guam, specifically, was the first and last port of call in the Spanish East Indies that ships traveling between the Philippines and Panama would see. And these very same pirates had attacked Panama not that long ago. They'd menaced Lima and they'd raided the Pacific coast of New Spain only a few months ago. Of course, Captain Swan didn't want to be a pirate, he wanted to be a merchant. And the men that were with him didn't want to be outright pirates either. Most of those who had their eyes on a career in piracy decided to go with Edward Davis back to the West Indies. These sailors had homes and families back in England. They weren't pirates. Not yet. But they had engaged in piracy, and it's not impossible to think that word of that piracy had reached Guam and that this priest may have heard of it. But Captain Swan sent his own letter to the governor, along with four yards of scarlet cloth, some silver, and gold lace. Now the governor was several miles away by sea, so Swan expected a reply the next morning at the earliest. But his letter was sent by Proa, as was the reply and the proas really were amazing. Three hours later, the governor's reply came. The governor thanked Swan for his gifts and sent along six hogs and two crates of melon. One of them was watermelon. He had instructions for the Comoro people as well. 
to collect coconuts on the island and to bake bread for the Englishmen. Every day the Camorro brought them fresh baked bread and coconuts, and every day the governor sent them more hogs and more fruit. All he asked in return was a little bit of money and a supply of powder and shot to bulk up his stores. They're hard to come by in these parts. This was an expert move on the part of the governor. I mean, he probably knew that these Englishmen were pirates, and he probably didn't want to send them food, but they did have money, and that was hard to come by in some parts of the empire. Even more than that, though, they had guns and men and the ear of the local hostile Indians. And they had experience at raiding Spanish forts that were undermanned. All the governor had was one undermanned Spanish fort. Were Swan so inclined, he could have attacked the fort, taken it, manned it with Camoro, and named himself King of Guam. Now that would be rash and stupid. The Spanish would of course come to take it back. But who's to say what these English barbarians were capable of? Besides, if that did happen, even though Spain would reclaim Guam, this governor would either be dead or in disgrace. Instead of that fate, the governor sent them hogs. And then Captain Charles Swan committed an act of mercenary treachery so vile, a betrayal so complete, that I'm shocked he lived to tell the tale. The agents that the Spanish governor sent with the foodstuffs had noted an English hound on board Signet, a hound which was much beloved by the crew. I mean, the men were prepared to eat their captain rather than the dog. And who can blame them here? The captain was fat and lusty and would feed them all, while the dog, well, he was a good boy. But Captain Swan was busy attempting to secure a letter of recommendation from the governor of Guam, and he found out that this Spanish governor had an interest in English hounds. So Swan gave the dog away. And you know, I'm willing to overlook a lot of the more horrible things that pirates did in their time. I'm willing to gloss over or even occasionally glorify some of their atrocities. But this, this is unacceptable. However, it worked. The governor agreed to write that letter, which would ingratiate Signet and the crew with the Spanish governor at Manila. Not only would that letter get him in with the Spanish, it would prove to the English officials in India that Swan and the Signet were not pirates, they were here as traitors. This was key to Captain Swan's plans to get home. But the men were still ignorant of it. And remember how I said that they weren't pirates yet? Well, Dampier writes, quote, While we lay here, the Acapulco ship arrived. She stood off to the southward of the island and was in great danger of being lost there. For though the shoal be so near the island, the master of the Acapulco ship was utterly ignorant of it. This put our men in a great heat to go out after her, but Captain Swan persuaded them out of that humor, for he was now wholly averse to any hostile action. End quote. Swan's goal was the Spanish capital in the region. For now, though, what he needed was peace with Spain to continue his mission of trade. And he had it. The governor sent one last shipment of food, including rice, biscuit, and pickled mango. Swan released the priest who had been his hostage, and he gave him gifts for his time and trouble of an astrolabe, a clock, and a telescope. These were rare and scholarly gifts for 1686, and the priest was so thrilled that he sent yet more hogs to the crew of Signet, along with a note informing them that the monsoon was about to arrive. If they intended to make Manila, they had better leave soon. As soon as their hogs were salted, they set sail. Today we're talking about the arrival of the Signet and her crew in the Philippines. 
As far as pirate stories go, there are a lot of similarities to the stories we know and love. Sandy beaches, crystal clear blue water, and palm trees. The Spanish Empire is all over this story, including their armadas of galleons. The pirate ship is familiar, and the pirates themselves are familiar. I mean, they're some of the same pirates that sailed on the first Pacific adventure, and they were all on the second. They had eye patches and flintlock pistols and cutlasses and rum. Of course, not everything was the same. The rum ran out before they even reached Asia, and after that there was none to be had. There was plenty of wine, though, and it flowed freely. There are a few parrots, but penguins are much more prevalent. There are Indians, but, you know, like actual Indians. Those sandy beaches might have looked similar, but they would have sounded different. The music would have been far different. In the West Indies, they had, you know, proto-blues and rock and roll. They had Spanish guitars and West African drums and rhythm. It had a Caribbean soundtrack, which is great. But over in the East Indies, it was different. They had entirely different musical styles and musical instruments. I think my favorite is the bamboo xylophone. It would have sounded a lot different. And the people were different. Even though this was the Spanish Empire, this was Nuevo España, there weren't that many Spanish people in the East Indies. Largely because the Filipino people that had lived there for centuries were still there. They had the immunities to, you know, not die when the Spanish showed up. And while they did have to live under the encomienda system of the Spanish Empire, they weren't slaves. It wasn't a whole lot better than slavery, if we're being honest, but it wasn't outright chattel slavery, and more to the point, they didn't have to import a large number of West Africans to work their plantations, because the Filipinos were there to do it. And there are the differences between vice in the West and East Indies. The drugs were arguably better in Asia. We'll be talking about that a bit today, but there's also the sex. And you might have noticed that Over the past several weeks, there have been repeated references to sex and sexuality. There have been several descriptions of mostly nude islander women and of their relations with the visitors to their islands. I mean, I've left a lot of stuff out of those discussions, the graphic stuff, and some of it's wild. But all of this isn't by accident. You know, it's not just me relishing the descriptions of those nude islander women. Well, you know, not just that... But it's so prevalent because it's so prevalent in the writings of Antonio P. Giaffetta and William Dampier. And, well, that's going to get worse before it gets better. This is episode 123, Den of Sin. Are you familiar with the term flesh pots of Asia? It's not a great turn of phrase, it's a little bit racist, and it's inaccurate on a couple of different levels. First of all, there's the word flesh pot. And... You know, I've noticed something about how I do this show. There are a few common touchstones I return to over and over. The Roman Empire is a big one. Mythology from around the world. World War II and World War I. Classic Golden Age horror movies. Oh my God, am I an old man? I just finished setting up my wood shop. Oh my God. All right, I'll I'll have my existential crisis later. The biggest touchstone that I turn to over and over again seems to be etymology. Word origins and their meanings make sense to me, and it's a tool that I use to understand the world around me. In this case, the word fleshpot. Fleshpot has a distinctly body connotation today. It's typically used to describe houses of salacious behavior. But that's far from the original meaning of the word. Originally, a flesh pot was literally just a pot of meat. It comes from the King James Bible in the book of Exodus. The passage in question reads, quote, And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we ate bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. End quote. And when they say flesh pots there, they mean just jars of cooked meat that they ate with bread to the full. The Israelites were lamenting being brought into the desert, even though they were escaping their captivity. They were reminiscing about the comforts that they enjoyed as slaves in Egypt. On that level, the 
based solely on definition, the image of flesh pots as a den of sin is inaccurate. However, I can accept that words change over time. I will not accept people saying literally when they mean the exact opposite of literally, and that's a hill I'm willing to die on because apparently I am an old man. But the word flesh pots has changed over time. When you Google Flesh Pots of Egypt, this description by Ph.D. candidate Jamie Wheeler comes up. Quote, The Flesh Pots of Egypt were so called because of their loose sexuality and equally loose morals. In the Bible, the Flesh Pots of Egypt are what the Israelites were trying to flee from due to the overt sexuality, greed, and general sin of the Egyptians against the one true God. Egypt was all about excess. End quote. Now that's wrong on many levels, and today many modern translations of the Bible have amended that verse from Exodus to say pots of flesh or even jars of meat. But I didn't share that quote to slam the author, even though I would take exception with a number of things in it. That's just what Google gives us. It's up at the top of the page in big, bold letters. So why did flesh pot come to mean overt sexuality and sin as opposed to just a jar of meat? How did it become so prevalent in our culture? There's a conversation to be had there regarding race and sexuality that I'm far from prepared to talk about. Honestly, really, that's a question one would need to ask of a philologist, but there are a few things that we could touch on. Remember back when we talked about Barbary and we discussed the image that North Africa had in Europe concerning their sex and morality? You know, Carthage was a hotbed of filthy feminine wiles ruled by an heiress of Jezebel herself. Egypt, in the time of Cleopatra, was ruled by a woman who used feminine wiles to bring down the Republic. Neither of those things are true, and both seem to be carefully constructed to suggest that a woman should never be allowed a position of power, but that stereotype spread. That stereotype of women and sexuality having an undue amount of influence... It spread to the Arabian world and Persia. It moved on to India, eventually to China, and then basically everywhere in the world that wasn't Europe or, you know, parts of the Americas was a lustful den of sin. And today we're going to look at one possible reason why. Let me read from the first paragraph of chapter 11 of A New Voyage Round the World by William Dampier. Quote, While we lay at Guam, we took up a resolution of going to Mindanao, one of the Philippine islands, being told by the friar, the friar that they had kidnapped, that it was exceedingly well stored with provisions. The natives were Mohammedans, and they had formerly a commerce with the Spaniards, but now they were at war with them. This island was therefore thought to be a convenient place for us to go, for besides that, the westerly monsoon was at hand which would oblige us to shelter somewhere. The inhabitants of Mindanao, being, as we were told, though falsely, at war with the Spaniards, our men, who were squeamish of plundering without license, derived hopes from thence of getting a commission there from the prince of the island to plunder the Spanish ships about Manila, and so to make Mindanao their common rendezvous. And if Captain Swan was minded to go out to an English port, yet his men, who thought he intended to leave them, hoped to get vessels and pilots at Mindanao fit for their turn to cruise on the coast of Manila. As for Captain Swan, he was willing enough to go thither as best suiting his own design, and therefore the voyage was concluded on by general consent. End quote. This paragraph is the thesis statement of the following several chapters of William Dampier's work. I'll be returning to it several times over the coming weeks. There's a lot to unpack in it. But we should move on with William Dampier and Charles Swan and the crew of the Signet. They sailed from Guam and arrived first at what Dampier calls St. John's Island, which was probably Samar. Then they arrived at the northeast tip of Mindanao. Now, Mindanao is the southernmost island of any real consequential size in the Philippines. And I shouldn't minimize that. Mindanao is one of the largest islands in the world. It's about the size of Cuba. 
It's dwarfed by a number of the surrounding islands like Borneo, Java, and Sumatra. They're real behemoths, but Mindanao is no slouch. And Mindanao is more than just the island. It's the name for the whole southern region of the Philippines. The central region, Visayas, included Cebu and Negros and a number of other islands. The northern region, which Dampier calls Luconia, includes the capital Manila on the island of Luzon. The Spanish held both the central Visaya region and the northern Luzon region. Manila was their capital of the Captaincy General of the Philippines. But Mindanao, the entire region, was not occupied by the Spanish. It was ruled instead by a sultan. The one-time Hindu rajas and Chinese Buddhist leaders that had been so prevalent there were gone. At this point, Mindanao was under the Sultanate of Maguindanao, and Sultan Barahaman. We'll get to him in a bit, but I don't want you to picture a rigid theocracy here. Linguistically, everyone on the island spoke either Filipino or Malay, but the ruling class and many of the people there also used Arabic. Beyond that, though, many of them spoke Portuguese, Chinese, and Spanish. The capital city of Mindanao had mosques, of course, but it also had Hindu and Buddhist temples and even a Catholic mission. Most people, at least, you know, the better sort of people, practiced Islam, but nearly everyone also still held on to their traditional animism. The markets were filled with goods from Europe and the Mediterranean, from the Middle East and India and China, as well as even the Americas. And the black markets were similarly well stocked. There was Moroccan hashish to be found, opium from the Golden Triangle, and a number of other intoxicants that we'll get to in a bit. And of course there was the most profitable of all black market products, the spices. It was a multicultural city, which made it perfect for the pirates. I'm sorry, the totally legitimate merchant sailors. And they, you know, they were legitimate. At least they looked honest. They were carrying trade goods that had transaction histories. They had papers, and they had a letter of recommendation from the Spanish governor on Guam. They looked legitimate as long as you chose to ignore that hullabaloo back in Panama and you happened not to notice the mountains of unspent Spanish gold in the crew's possession. And the Spanish might or might not ignore it. If at all possible, even though they had that letter of recommendation, it would be best to avoid the Spanish. And Mindanao offered such a haven. But that does seem a bit odd. I mean, why didn't the Spanish just take the island over? Well, first of all, they didn't really need it. Manila served their purposes just fine as a fortified harbor and government center. Remember, they weren't building expansionistically. They didn't have huge plantations because they were able to use the regional labor already available. But I think even more important than that, we need to realize that there are certain realities of empire which anybody who's ever lived on the fringes of an empire is already aware of. They're less prevalent today, but we still see the vapors of it. The first of these realities is the need for an enemy, and not communists or terrorists or anything that big. No existential threats, no huge imperial boogeymen. We're not talking about the barbarians at the gates here. We're talking about an enemy next door, an adversarial neighbor, maybe a mortal frenemy. You see arrangements like that all over the fringes of empire. You saw them in the West Indies between the French, Spanish, English, and Dutch. You know, when funds were running low in your colony, especially at peacetime, the Captain General at Manila could always write to the Viceroy in Mexico and spin him a tale of pirates and guerrilla attacks from all of those wily Mohammedans down south. At the same time, the sultan there at Mindanao could hold parades in his honor and the honor of his brave soldiers and spin his own tales about holding the imperial might of Spain at bay. All the while, there was very little actual fighting going on. Hence, why William Dampier would write, quote, Mindanao being, as we were told, though falsely, at war with the Spaniards. 
There's always a war on, even when there's no war being fought. That's helpful for many reasons, including propaganda, but also trade. It's helpful to have someone next door with whom you can trade clandestinely for any goods that might be hard to come by, or even goods that might be forbidden. We'll dive into the spices next time, but say you needed some of those black market goods and you couldn't find them at home because of your strictly regulated markets. That's what Mindanao was for. Plus, in the case of Mindanao, it created a nice little buffer between the Spanish and the Portuguese. The Portuguese held a ton of territory in Indonesia, to the south and west of the Philippines, including much of the Spice Islands and it was helpful to have a little buffer state there so that there would be no territorial disputes between the Spanish and the Portuguese. That means everything stays nice and peaceful. And then, of course, there were the monsoons. Dampier said, quote, The westerly monsoon was at hand, which would oblige us to shelter somewhere, end quote. The monsoon winds in Southeast Asia were, and still are a governing factor for much of the reality of life. The westerly monsoon, which blew east, would blow in around September, and that made traveling west, across the Indian Ocean, say, very difficult. Travelers were likely to be stranded for several months in that case. So imagine you're the Captain General of the Philippines, You are responsible for the stability of the colony, as well as the upkeep of the Manila-Acapulco fleet, and therefore the maintaining of imperial profit. However, you do operate on a tight budget to ensure that profits stay as high as possible. Would you want to deal with a bunch of stranded foreigners? Say that there's a ship full of Dutch merchants, or, say, English pirates, that were trapped in the Philippines due to the monsoons for several months. You would have to either house them, and therefore feed them, or imprison them, and therefore feed them, or otherwise kill them and risk an incident. And in the West Indies, that wouldn't be a huge issue. They had the legal and institutional capacity to deal with that sort of thing, as well as the infrastructure. But the East Indies were a lot more bare bones. Remember, the Spanish presence there was almost solely military. They didn't have all of the institutions that existed in Mexico or Cuba, so they had to write to the Viceroy for any of those big decisions, like killing Englishmen. It was a lot easier to keep your frenemy around to the south. They had the food and the houses of worship necessary, as well as the luxuries that one would need to entertain stranded travelers that could come from almost any corner of the globe. So you keep Mindanao around. The benefits far outweigh the detriments of not holding that one single island. The crew arrived at the northeast corner of Mindanao in late June. They made their way south and then west, clockwise around the island. Now this was a long and leisurely trip. They made several stops to collect water and to hunt the copious game they found on the island. At one point they found a field so filled with deer that they caught 17 or 18 of them in an afternoon and ate venison for weeks after. On their travel they saw several villages and met a number of people. Now they couldn't speak to any of them and some of the people would run away but usually they would smile and point them to the west. Dampier makes note of the site that would go on to become the most populous and prosperous city on Mindanao, Davao City. It already had a village there, but Dampier noted the excellent anchorage. But they continued on, and finally made the west coast of Mindanao. At that point they began seeing fishing proa and coastal settlements almost constantly. It was clear they were closing in on civilization. They arrived at what's called the Moro Gulf. Dampier noted the excellent anchorage here as well, and they saw a series of small islands some twenty leagues off. Much like the site that would go on to become the home of Davao City, this was an excellent place for a large and populous habitation. Little did they know, they had found the capital. It was just 
hidden. Rather than go ashore, though, Captain Swan ordered Signet to put down anchor and to wait. Now, nobody on board spoke Filipino. They didn't have an interpreter. But Swan still gathered his closest advisors around him. That included William Dampier. It also included the surgeon and the surgeon's mate, Herman Coppinger, and it brought in Mr. Harthop, the factor. John Reed, the pilot of the vessel who we met last time, was probably not present, but three new characters were. There was the captain's mate, Mr. Nelly, an Irishman, and Mr. Henry Moore, the quartermaster of Signet. And there was also Mr. Smith, who was a merchant they had captured in Mexico several months before, who spoke fluent Spanish. That evening, two ships sailed out to meet the Signet and her small bark. The first of these ships looked to be a pleasure barge. It was complete with a canopy of leaves and musicians. There was a cadre of women festooned in all sorts of finery, and there were pretty girls to fan the young man that was sitting at the center of all of it. The second ship was much more austere. It was outfitted for war. They had brass guns, a reinforced hull, and men that carried bows and sabers. At their head was an older man who was strong and looked very fierce. The warship put a boat into the water, and the fierce-looking man climbed in. They rowed over to the pleasure barge and picked up the young man there. They rowed over to Signet and hailed her. To everyone's surprise, they did so in Spanish. Mr. Smith was fluent, and he answered them in Spanish, but there were others who spoke the language. Dampier and Swan spoke a bit, as did Henry Moore, but Mr. Smith spoke the best Spanish. The Filipino ambassadors, upon learning that the crew here were Englishmen, were delighted. They knew of the English and understood their relationship with the Spanish. We need to remember that, while the crew of Signet had never met any of these people before, the era of exploration was long past. But these two Filipino men seemed to be expecting Swan and Dampier. They acted as though they were welcoming in old friends. This was confusing. The two men refused to board Signet, however, even though they were invited. Instead, they invited Captain Swan to come ashore that evening and meet the king. At that point, they left. Swan was perplexed by that engagement, but nonetheless he ordered a salute fired and received a return salute. That entire experience was odd. If you were a suspicious person, it might seem like they were going out of their way to make the captain feel welcome and to get him to come ashore. Swan deliberated with his advisors here. Should he go ashore? Everyone eventually agreed that no, Swan should stay with the ship. Instead, they elected to send Henry Moore, the quartermaster. He spoke enough Spanish to make do, and he was trustworthy. More than that, though, if he were horrifically murdered and ritualistically eaten, the ship was free to choose a new quartermaster. And that right there is some top-tier career advice, people. You want to be good enough at what you do that you will be considered for the big, exciting projects, but you don't want to be so indispensable that you won't be considered for another position. Be like Henry Moore. Swan and Mr. Harthop, the merchant factor on board, outfitted a chest and filled it with the gifts that would be suitable for a king. There were lengths of beautiful dyed cloth and a selection of both gold and silver lace. Mr. Moore, alone, took that chest into a boat and rowed ashore. The crew of the signet watched as he approached the beach. They watched with bated breath as they saw a party of hard-eyed, scimitar-wielding, torch-carrying men emerge from the tree line. They stood like statues as the quartermaster made landfall. As he reached back to collect the chest full of finery, one of the soldiers stopped him. They searched the chest while another searched more himself. Apparently satisfied, these soldiers lifted the chest out of the boat and dragged the boat further ashore. Then they led Henry Moore into the darkness of the tree line. 
I imagine this was absolutely terrifying for Henry Moore. And you know, I considered telling this bit of the tale entirely from the point of view of the crew that was still on board, but I think it's better to tell what Henry Moore probably experienced. First of all, there was virtually no seaside building on Mindanao. The reason that the city was hidden from view will eventually become clear. Instead, there was an empty beach with a dense, dark tree line. The men who emerged from that tree line and greeted Mr. Moore on that empty beach were small but very well muscled. They had dark eyes and then their mouths. These men all had black teeth, and their mouths were stained red with something. When Moore was led into the trees, he was plunged into a dense jungle. He was surrounded by torchbearers, so he couldn't see that far, but he could hear the sounds of nocturnal life, and occasionally he would see glowing eyes staring back at him. It was a long and winding road on a dark and stormy night. I mean, not really. I don't want to overplay it here, but it did take a while to get to town. When they did finally see civilization approaching, they saw it through the torches that were sticking out of the ground, literally tiki torches. The buildings, when he saw them, were all built on stilts several feet off the ground. There were men outside each of the buildings, and women stared out at him from inside. The houses were impressive, if humble. There were a few larger buildings, marketplaces, and warehouses, but everything was built above the ground. And then Moore saw a huge number of torches and braziers lighting a truly massive structure. It was made all of bamboo and stone mosaic. It was also built on stilts. But these weren't bamboo, they were huge tree trunks, as wide as they were tall. There was a stone walkway leading up to a set of double doors guarded by large, scarred, dark-skinned men holding huge halberds. As the party approached, those men opened the doors and Henry Moore went inside. And what he saw there shocked him. He returned to the signet the following morning, a little bit worse for the wear. Dampier and Swan questioned him. You know that feeling when you've been out all night, when you didn't sleep a wink, when you probably imbibed a bit too much and made some questionable decisions? That feeling when you have to take the walk of shame home to your roommates who are busy getting ready for work? I imagine that Henry Moore felt something similar. The previous night, he arrived at the central chamber of the palace to see the two men that had approached the signet earlier that day waiting for him. They were sitting on the floor, cross-legged, along with a few other men and many, many women. The women were dancing and laughing and eating from the bowls of rice and fruit and meat, literal flesh pots, that were strategically placed all around the room. The air was heavy with incense and tobacco smoke, as well as the smell of hashish. Bamboo hookahs were available for anyone in the room to use, even the women. Now, there was no alcohol, but there was tea and fruit juice, and everyone was chewing on... something. Maybe nuts, it looked like. There were huge piles of green nuts on platters all around. At the center of all of this was a slight, smiling, elderly man. This was the sultan's household. And everyone, from the sultan down to the servants, had those same black teeth and red mouths. Moore could see it clearly here as everyone was smiling and laughing and singing. But when he arrived, everyone turned to watch the newcomer. The women were especially watchful. You have to imagine that Henry Moore tried very hard not to watch back. The quartermaster was presented to the sultan, who didn't speak any Spanish, but he was flanked by those two men from earlier. The young man from the pleasure barge turned out to be the sultan's eldest son. The older man, the hard-eyed soldier, was the sultan's younger brother. And his name was Raja Laut. And you need to remember Raja Laut. He's going to become very important to our story as it unfolds. At this point, though, all the eyes were turned toward the sultan. For our purposes, we'll call him what he is best known to history as 
Sultan Barahaman. Although, to be fair, we're not going to be seeing him that much. His brother, Raja Laut, is a much bigger player in our story. We'll look at all that next time. For now, though, let's focus on Henry Moore. He presented the gifts to Sultan Barahaman, who was greatly pleased. Henry Moore thought on his feet a little bit here. That's why you want to trust someone like Henry Moore when he realized that one of the men who had come to visit was the general and brother of the sultan, he split up the gifts and gave him some of those as well. The sultan, pleased, instructed Moore to invite Captain Swan and his top fellows to come visit him the following morning, and then he retired. A number of the women in the room retired as well, probably his wives and concubines, but the festivities continued. And once the sultan left, they became a little less formal. Moore was offered food and tea, which he eagerly accepted. He went on to smoke with Raja Laut and the prince. And the women, they kept their distance, but they watched more. And they danced. But before the dancing, before we get to that, the men, the Raja and the sultan's son, showed Henry Moore how to enjoy their most favorite pastime. That paste that they were all chewing did come from those nuts. And it turns out that these were the nut of the betel plant. The nut of the betel plant tastes awful. Oftentimes people will mix them with mustard seed to cover the flavor. And in fact, all of the men here had little pouches on their belts that they used to carry their favorite flavor additive to aid in the consumption of the betel nut. It's funny to me. That alcohol is so prevalent in the history of all world civilization. Every culture has its own alcohol. The people of Mindanao had their own brew, but it wasn't at the Sultan's house, because in the Muslim world, alcohol is forbidden. And yet, probably as a consequence of that, most of the best drugs in the world, in some form or fashion, come from the Muslim world. I mean, I guess you have to improvise when God tells you not to drink. Muslims developed many of these, but in many cases it was the pirates who spread them. You know, the Barbary pirates who encountered hashish in Morocco loved it. The Caribbean pirates who were introduced to the coca leaf couldn't get enough, and I know that wasn't Islamic, but just roll with me here. And the modern Somali pirates chew chat all day long. And right here, In this den of pious, godly drug use, there's no sin occurring, Henry Moore was introduced to the betel nut, which was called Bwai. Bwai is, even today, big business in Southeast Asia. We're talking about millions of dollars and tens of thousands of jobs. Bwai gets you high. It's been described as a dizzy, sweaty, energetic euphoria. Henry Moore loved it. It's highly addictive, and it kept him up all night. The unmarried women who were there chewed the stuff as well, and then they began to dance. They weren't wearing very much, and their dances turned out to be about as intoxicating as the boy. At some point, the sultan's son retired as well, so Moore was left sitting with Raja Laut to watch the dancers. And Raja Laut's wives came over and doted on Mr. Moore. They lit the hookah for him. They brought him tea, and they asked him questions that the Raja, smiling, translated. The questions were frank and a little bit daring. Henry Moore was probably nervous about answering them to the face of the husband of the women asking them. And, you know, I'm brushing past the whole polygamy thing. We'll talk about that later. But as the night wore on, inhibitions began to lessen. Moore enjoyed himself that evening. However, reportedly it was relatively innocent. You know, as innocent as taking drugs all night on the other side of the world can be. But William Dampier writes, quote, The women are very desirous of the company of strangers, especially white men, and doubtless would be very familiar if the custom of the country did not debar them from that freedom which seems coveted by them. End quote. Dampier is suggesting that the women were not familiar due to the customs of Mindanao, 
and that probably was true occasionally, but, as we all know, bad behavior is defined by breaking the rules. I suspect that Henry Moore enjoyed himself far more than the text suggests to us. See, the general of Mindanao, Raja Laut, was overjoyed at the English presence, and he wanted something from the crew of Signet. And when you are after something, and you go through the trouble of throwing a large and lavish party for your new guest, you do everything in your power to ensure that they are happy. What the Raja wanted, and exactly how he planned to go about getting it, well, that's a topic for next week. But that was the concern of Charles Swan and William Dampier, of Mr. Harthop. Mr. Moore, on the other hand, well, he was the quartermaster. He would have told the captain all about these large concerns, but his job was overseeing the crew and he told the crew all about his experiences in the home of the sultan, about the boy, about the food, and about the women. Even if Mr. Moore's night was mostly innocent, I'm certain that he told the men on board that it was anything but. That dichotomy, that difference in priorities here, it's going to become a major element in the story moving forward. Next time, our characters go to town in Mindanao. They meet the sultan and the rajah, and they learn all about the situation. The situation in Mindanao, the situation in the Philippines, and the larger situation in Southeast Asia. And they have to make some big decisions about how they are going to fit into that world. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show, everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon, everybody who has left us a rating or a review, and everybody who has recommended this show. Without all of you, I wouldn't be able to do this. Thank you. Our theme music was The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't gone to check them out yet, I certainly suggest you do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at Pirate History Podcast, or you can get in touch on Twitter, Reddit, SoundCloud, or YouTube. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.